Today's sermon is on the subject of faith, hope, and charity. I've really given it a lot of thought and prayer this past week, and I felt convicted to talk about these items because it's so important, especially in these times when many of us are staying at home and not certain about what the future holds. Let's turn in our Bibles or look at the screen to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'll read verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. That's something that I've really given a lot of thought to because we know without faith it's impossible to please God. And we have to have hope as Christians for salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But here God clearly tells us that charity is the greatest of these three. So I think it's very worthwhile discussing each of these three words and what they mean. The purpose of this sermon is, first of all, what are faith, hope, and charity in terms of natural meanings? Hopefully all of us know those words well, but I'd like to revisit that as starting the sermon out. And then what I'd like to do is uh, discuss what are faith, hope, and charity in terms of spiritual meanings. That's very important as Christians that we uh, understand what God means by spiritual faith, spiritual hope, and spiritual charity. Because they might not be exactly the same as the natural definitions. And then I want to talk about examples of faith, hope, and charity, how it relates to uh, my experiences as a Christian, and hopefully you'll be inspired by some of the examples that I'll give. So I'm going to start out. What are faith, hope, and charity in terms of natural meanings? I just went straight to the Webster's Dictionary on this. Faith, an allegiance to duty or a person, loyalty. For example, lost faith in the company's president due to, you know, potentially whatever problems there were. Another definition is fidelity to one's promises, sincerity of intentions acted in good faith, belief and trust in and loyalty to God, belief in the traditional doctrines of a religion, firm belief in something for which there is no proof clinging to the faith that her missing son would one day return. Complete trust something that is believed especially with strong conviction. For example, a system of religious beliefs, the Protestant faith. That's coming out of the Secular Dictionary, Webster's 1828. Faith. Boiling faith down as a secular definition, it really comes down to uh, belief and trust. Uh, If you have faith, you really are convicted about something in a natural sense. Hope. What is the definition of hope? To cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen, or to be true. And then there's examples given. Uh, Trust is an archaic definition, and then another definition is to desire with expectation of obtainment or fulfillment, to expect with confidence. Again, the word trust is used. So, If we're anticipating something, we're hoping for something. We're hoping to see our relatives at Christmas time. We're hoping to see a number of people get saved. We are hoping that, you know, the country and the world will get back to normal productivity soon so that we can function as a society as we once were. I think it's pretty straightforward what the word means in its natural sense. What about charity? This is a word that we should be familiar with. Uh, Generosity and helpfulness, especially toward the needy or suffering. Uh, Another definition, an institution engaged in relief of the poor, raised funds for several charities, for example. Public provision for the relief of the needy. Uh, Benevolent goodwill toward or love of humanity. So boiling it down, charity in a secular sense is when those that have give to those that have not. 
when the rich give to the poor would be another way to say it. Suppose you could say, you know, say it any way that you want, but to give to those in need is ultimately charity. And I think that probably everyone listening has participated in some form of charity uh, during their lives, I hope. Second thing I like to talk about is what are faith, hope, and charity in terms of spiritual meanings? As Christians, it's very, very important that we understand this. Faith, let's start with that. For example, a born-again believer may have a gift of faith, which gives a supernatural ability to endure trials, persecutions, and crimes with the belief that Jesus Christ is in control and has a purpose for whatever happens. I purposely left that off because I just wanted to leave it blank for people. A purpose for something. And that is a spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit to some people. You have to have faith to be a Christian. And then once you become a Christian, if God gave you a spiritual gift of faith, you have something that not necessarily all other Christians have. You have a supernatural ability for faith to possibly get through something that maybe would be a real struggle for others. So I wanted to make mention of that. And I want to continue by quoting some scripture. It says in Romans chapter 10, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's important that we recognize that it's God's word that produces faith. As far as spiritual faith goes, if you don't have God's word, according to God, you don't have faith. And you look out into the world today, and I, in the past I've, shown how, you know, uh, quoted United Nations uh, when they say, you know, whether we worship one God, many gods, or no God at all, we must strengthen our faith. Well, that contradicts what God says. God says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you have to have the word of God to have faith. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to seek God, because if you trust in men and trust in the markets and think that you can wander around and easily find the word of God in a world that is being ruled by Lucifer, you're in a delusion. You need to seek God out. Pray, the Lord will lead you to his word, but you have to want to seek him out. We who are Christians know in the English language, that is the authorized version of 1611, to the exclusion of other versions, even though we've talked about uh, the Reformation Bibles do have oil in them. Uh, the modern Bibles today almost entirely are dumb idols give an example of faith. There is a pastor that I know, and I attended his church, oh, a little more than a decade ago, and he was a man of great faith, meaning he believes every word of the Bible, and he believes in the purity of the testimony. He doesn't accept dross. He doesn't accept men's apologetics. He trusts in the Lord, and when he reads his Bible, he reads with faith, and he believes every single word. Well, this man, because of his faith, did not have much money, and he had to gather in a public place, let's say, I uh, can't remember exactly what it was, but something like a school gymnasium that he may have rented out for a small amount of money to have a small congregation gather. And they needed a church they didn't have a building to worship in. And what he decided to do, rather than tickling people's ears and doing fundraisers and uh, asking the few people that attended his gatherings uh, that would call church to give more and more money, he simply prayed day after day, not in a vain repetition, but prayed sincere prayers 
for many people, but he also asked God, please give me a church for a dollar. Won't you, Lord, give me a church for a dollar? And he wouldn't say it the same way every day, but in his heart, that's what he wanted so bad, is that God would give him a church so that they would have a place to worship in. And year after year, he kept praying, and he never gave up. I tell, I'll tell you right now, I would have given up, and I think most people would give up. But not this guy. He kept praying and trusting in Jesus Christ. And after seven years, he got a letter in the mail from a bank saying that for one dollar, he was going to be able to have a church. And this church was located in McKesney Park, Illinois. And uh, that story he told me when he came to my house one time, when we were talking about the purity of the text of the Word of God, and we were edifying one another. And I remember being so deeply touched and convicted by this man who did not hesitate to continue to pray because he had faith. He was not going to give up. He trusted God, and when God was ready, he rewarded this man with a church. Let's talk about Christian hope. It says in Psalm 147, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. In Titus chapter 1 it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. It says in Daniel chapter 12, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. To me, this is all so powerful because God tells us he takes pleasure in them that fear him. If you've been chastened and received by the Lord, you know what that fear is. God has taught you that. And you hope in his mercy that he has saved you from the hell you deserve and that you have eternal life. And one of the most encouraging and comforting parts of God's word to me is in Daniel chapter 12 when it says many shall be purified and made white and tried as opposed to just the few that find their way and get saved. God in his great mercy is going to uh, purify many in the time of the end because the earth is desolate and empty. And Jesus asked, will he find faith when he cometh? And this is what keeps me going as a Christian and also as a pastor, the hope that many will in fact be purified and made white and saved. That is my hope. There's many people that I love that are still lost, that have not been born again of the Spirit. And my hope is that God will open their eyes and Daniel 12 comforts me greatly. I'm also going to talk about a very inspiring uh, account that some of you may find linked to hope, and that is the Joplin tornado of 2011. I remember in May of 2011 um, when this happened, and it was just a devastating tornado. You can see on the screen that, it, it, you know, homes were completely destroyed. The tornado was one of the strongest tornadoes uh, that we've had in a long, long time, and I think the most dis expensive and destructive in the history of our nation. So I found this article, The Mysterious Butterfly People of Missouri, and I put the link there of this article. It says, May 22nd of 2011 in Joplin, Missouri, they were hit by, and I'm, just, I'm not going to read every word, but I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but a very powerful tornado. It reached approximately one mile across, up to 200 mile an hour winds, almost $3 billion in damage, 161 dead, over 1,000 more injured, making it the seventh deadliest tornado in U.S. history and the costliest the country has ever seen. Yet from within the whirl of death during the disaster, 
there come strange reports of ethereal beings that came forward from some unknown place to reportedly help those in need, and which have come to be called the Butterfly People of Joplin. Young children saw them. A two-and-a-half-year-old in a car blown over said that they were in a car with her and Daddy, a young boy riding in a truck with his dad while a car was hurling at them said two angels threw the car so it couldn't hit them. A girl and her mom, who took refuge in a ditch, were protected by the beautiful rainbow wings of the angel people. A five-year-old caught out in the open in the tornado said three glowing figures with butterfly wings stood around him and kept him safe. A four-year-old boy was in a hospital that was demolished and found unhurt six miles away. The angels brought me and set me down here. A young boy was caught outside with his father. The storm ripped his father's shoes off, but they were unhurt. The butterfly people were hovering over them. A family with four young children living in a trailer in the path of the tornado lost their five-year-old. He was found unhurt about 20 feet from the house wrapped in a green rug like a burrito. They didn't know who wrapped him up or where the rug even came from. He said a man with brown hair was hovering over him. 14-year-old Emily was in a vehicle tossed two blocks and impaled through the leg with debris. During months of recovery, she claimed butterflies would flock to her and land all over her. I'm going to say that uh, this is very touching to me, but not a surprise whatsoever. As a Christian, just about everyone that I know that has been born again of the Spirit has testified of how an angel has intervened in their life or the lives of people that they know. And this is nearly every single born-again Christian that I know gives this testimony. And I have no doubt that this is hidden from the unsaved world. People that haven't received the Holy Spirit, this stuff may be science fiction to them. But it is my hope that God, in his great mercy, protects those that he knows will ultimately believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just, for inspiration purposes, wanted to make uh, you know, a reading on this subject, this tornado. Although it was tragic and it happened almost a decade ago, there was some definite inspiration and, and I will call uh, things that really inspire hope in some of us. And uh, I, I think that we just need to be aware that God is in control always. And even through times of devastation, there is always hope. I'm going to talk about Christian charity. And I'm going to try to just make it concise. Christian charity is when the poor give to the rich. This is the greatest of all. Unlike Secular charity, when the rich give to the poor, Christian charity is the opposite, when the poor give to the rich. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. The Holy Ghost is a free gift given to us by God. Without the Holy Ghost, you're not going to get a spiritual testimony, and you're never going to know the Lord Jesus Christ because you'll be a natural person only. But if you have the Holy Spirit and God has brought you down and taken all of your ego away from you, you can now edify others. And that is linked to charity. Now you have something, a free gift from God, that the richest person on earth could not purchase. And you can go out and, because of the love of God, edify other people, testifying of what God has done for you, all because you had faith. In Proverbs chapter 13, There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. God tries your heart. Are you willing to forsake everything that you have in order to follow Jesus? Are you willing to forsake it all, all the money that you have, your family, everything, to follow Jesus? 
Well, I'll tell you, God knows whether or not you are. He'll try us, and he'll see if we are really deeply convicted or not. And then, if he receives us, we will be chastened, and it is God that decides who gets what type of spiritual gift to go out into the world for his glory so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached. It says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is that just literally poor people? No, it's not. God is speaking spiritually. It says in Isaiah 66, For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. God is describing a poor in spirit person as someone that has been born again. They have been chastened and received, and sometimes that process is horrifying. I know in my case, I, I felt for six weeks straight like I had so much pain that there was hot oil pouring all over me, and the words of God kept going through my mind. It was beyond anything I could imagine in terms of sheer terror. And this is something that is a unique experience, but it's also part of what God says everyone gets that gets born again. You get some form of chastening. Some are beaten with few stripes, some beating with many stripes to the point where God brings you close to death. He tries you and uh, may leave you for dead just to, to, to see what's in your heart. But once this happens and you know the fear of God and he takes that chastening away and starts to edify you uh, and teach you his word, uh, then you get the peace of the Holy Spirit and the joy and you can start discerning spiritual things because you've got the comforter in you that's teaching you the word of God. Now you can go out, even though you've been made poor, and it might be literal poor. In my case, I had to quit my job. There's no way you can go to work when you feel like boiling oil is being poured all over you and you've got the words be not deceived God is not mocked going through your head in a continuous loop you can't even focus I had to quit my job had a great job by the way and I couldn't work had to give notice uh, you know I've got a <laughs> I don't know if I told them exactly what my problem was but I gave notice that I could not continue uh, and if I had to fill out the human resource documents, it would have said, well, I feel like a vat of boiling oil is being poured on my head, and the words, be not deceived, God is not mocked, are continuously going through my mind in a never-ending loop, and I am in so much fear, I can barely function as a human. I don't know how much weight I lost, but I couldn't eat, and... Uh, and God, in his great mercy, sent an angel to me after about six months to let me know that I was saved because I prayed for it. But the whole point is, God had compassion on me. He could have killed me, but he made me poor so that I could be rich in terms of understanding his wisdom and understanding, to share it with others, not to work only for myself, my own selfish interest, but to help people, help people so that they can be born again and that they know what the right word of God is. So that to me is a, an example of charity is when God loves you so much that he saves you. And then when you come out of that chastening, you have that love of God in you to where you just want to go and help spread the gospel to others for no selfish purposes but for the true love of God and the love of your neighbor. That's what charity is all about. So in conclusion, I'm going to close with this. As I have read and been taught by the Holy Spirit, uh, I'll just give a few examples to close. In Proverbs chapter 31, a lot of people can understand a natural testimony that God is describing a good wife, but spiritually he's describing the bride of Christ. In John chapter 2, Jesus made wine out of water. 
symbolic of people being born again, God is defining wine as doctrine being made out of the water of the word so that we don't necessarily have a negative connotation when God uses wine as a spiritual symbol. Sometimes it's positive. Job 28, my personal favorite chapter in the entire word of God is Job chapter 28. It means so much to me because God describes molten materials and treasures in the earth. And in doing this, he is announcing without hesitation the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in this chapter. It is like nothing that I can recall out of any other part of the Bible. It really inspires me. Job 28, there's so much prophecy going on, but it's all about Jesus Christ and salvation. Uh, so please read Job 28 uh, when you can. It is truly the most amazing and favorite chapter of mine. Although I think as Christians we should all be convicted by whatever God uh, decides to point out to us in his word. Psalm 104 uh, describes large boats or ships that are being attacked by a sea monster. Spiritually what this means is that false Bibles have been created by this sea monster called Leviathan and they're keeping people unsaved on the earth because they're deluded until they're called by God. So it's just a spiritual interpretation of something, but I hope that this is at least a brief example of what someone might discern naturally versus the next level of spiritual depth. When you start getting edified by the Holy Spirit, you see more into the Word of God and you get more of a spiritual meaning. And that spiritual meaning has greater and greater depth to it as you mature in your faith. That being said, I'm going to conclude this sermon. I hope that everyone has a great week, and I look forward to uh, giving another sermon in the upcoming week. Take care, be safe, God bless everyone.